What is up, Conscious Monkeys? Welcome to another episode of Traveling to Consciousness. I am your host, Clayton Kuteri, and today's guest has quite the resume. From metaphysics to business to traveling, stuff that I think we all love and have talked about on this podcast, he's experimented with over 50 different energetic healing techniques, discovered his ability to time travel, uses telepathy on his cat and his son, utilizes his dreams to learn. He's proficient in building relationships with famous people, discusses why we shouldn't focus on money whenever we're developing our business. And he also discusses the five different levels of abundance. He also discusses how to use an adventure mindset for success, which is something I am hoping we get to in this. Uh, He set a world record for climbing three volcanoes in a day, and discovered a new species in Yellowstone National Park. So guys, we're going to do our best to see if we can intertwine all these things. I think we got it. But with that being said, Conscious Monkeys, welcome to the show, Derek Loudermilk. Derek, thank you for being here. Leighton, great to meet you and thanks for having me. I th- I'm honored, man, because this is incredible. And anyone who listened to episode 033, um, Beth recommended that we get in touch and do this. So I'm honored that she did because Derek sent me over this resume and I was just like, shit, dude, like Beth nailed it. (laughs) Like, I love talking about all this stuff. Like we're down. (laughs) Yeah. Beth is, Beth is a reliable, uh, she's, she's got the vibe out for, for the interesting folks. So good to connect. She's tapped in, man. So this is an incredible resume. So let's start, I think at the beginning is probably the best place to start. So okay, when I was a baby, when you were a baby, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you said you could time travel. So <laughs> re, re, uh, retell us about how that happened. <laughs> uh, no, but let's start out what you wanted to be when you grew up. Were you always fascinated with, um, you know, the structure of reality? Were you always down to be like an entrepreneur was traveling on it? But, you know, what was the first thing that little Derek wanted to be whenever he grew up? Well, I, th- you know, this is such an interesting question because I have kids now and when you ask them what you want to be when they grow up, that what they really answer is what they want to be right then and there. And so I was different things at different times, but I, I think an astronaut was probably the the longest running uh, version. And and it was really this vibe of being an explorer, you know, going where seeing something new, seeing something that that I could come back and say like, hey, I discovered something. And that's kind of a theme through my whole life. I was a biologist looking for the beginnings of life. Uh, when, I, when I'm when i exploring spirituality, I'm trying to discover something new. Um, and I just get so excited if I if I find something out, I just want to come and share it with, with whoever it is. Um, and that's, you know, that's been happening my whole life. <laughs> I love that. So what would have been maybe your first discovery that you've shared with people and You know, maybe they would have called you crazy because that's where all the great discoveries are. But what was like the first thing that you discovered and you were like, guys, check this out. That's a really good question. You know, what's coming up for me is when I was an athlete, I ran cross country in high school and college. And um, before that, I was on the U.S. short track speed skating team. And then I was a pro cyclist. And there was the way that I treat it, I think was different than other athletes. I, I really treated it like a journey of self exploration, a, because especially in endurance sports, you're, you're mastering your own attention and your mind in order to be able to live at this edge of where it's just really uncomfortable for sometimes hours on end. And you have to be a little bit crazy to, to do that. And, uh, so, so I would just spend so much time thinking about the psychology of, of being an endurance athlete. And then we would sit around the table, my teammates and I, and just like really dive into this, this nuance of the experience of, of being in pain and enjoying it. Uh, (laughs) and so then other people, right. Other friends that weren't runners, they would come and they would sit with us at our table and then they would get up and leave because they were like, you guys are just like way too into this. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) They're just like, these guys are off the wall. (laughs) 
Yes, you know, like how much can you really talk about running? Like, let's be honest. Uh, I don't know, man. I mean, I'm sure you. I mean, if you were doing it for lunches on lunches, right? You guys were able to pull it off for hours at a time. Yeah, you know, and it's like I lived with these guys. We would run for hours at a time together. We would sit at meals and discuss running. You know, we would just like living the whole the whole running lifestyle, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're competing at that level, right, you would almost have to com become completely immersed in that, you know, whatever it is, running cyclist. So it could have been a benefit. Do you feel like there was any hindrance of, you know, maybe needing to be a little bit more adventurous or being able to like kind of spread out and do different things? Well, when you're seeking to master something, almost the rest of your life is just way out of balance uh, because you're spending so much energy and attention uh, towards one thing that, yeah, like relationships, uh, getting good at anything else just gets put on the back burner. And what was kind of interesting though, was like if I was studying biochemistry, I would always be thinking, okay, how can I learn a little bit more about um, how the blood delivers oxygen to the muscles and can I optimize my body pH to make me a better runner? So it was always, can I learn a thing to make me a better runner? So mm. I was often exploring, but with an eye towards applying everything that I could towards this one pursuit. And I sort of do the same thing today when I'm learning about metaphysical things. I'm always thinking, can I teach this to entrepreneurs so that they can use it if they have some big project they're working on, can they actually use uh, this technique in, in their lives in some way? You're right. And what I'm curious about is, have you found this crossover maybe between like, because the way I kind of see it is everything's connected, right? At the end of the day. So have you found a lot of crossover parallels between being a professional, you know, cyclist, professional runner and running a business, I guess, pun not intended. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I will say that one thing that athletes have, especially if they have spent, you know, more than five years trying to progress, because the way I see it, usually it takes five to seven years to hit your sort of really peak talent as an athlete. And if you've done something that long, if you've, if you've put your effort into a multi-year project, then you understand sort of the phases of like, wow, I did something good early on and it gives me some excitement and momentum. And then you learn some more and you realize you're still just a baby, still a beginner, and you have way farther to progress. And you're like, wow, okay, I see what it will take to get get there, you know? Because um, you might think you're hot shit at first and then you, you compete against the people that are actually good and you realize... Uh, I have so much to learn. And so it's this, this long-term development of a skill, but also your experience of being involved in an activity that, you know, right now I'm probably eight years into my entrepreneurial journey. So I'm like a level one pro at this point. Like I'm, you know, I've, I've gotten good enough where I'm, I can understand where the cutting edge is and I'm getting into the process of being creative and doing brand new things in business now, but it took me seven years of perfecting things to actually get to this like basic platform. And so if people haven't had the experience of doing something long and hard in their life, it can feel, well, it just feels very unknown. You know, it's, it's a little bit destabilizing to think that long term, And yet there's something that the native Americans say, which is, can you make decisions, you know, multiple generations down? Can you think design a, a way of living or a business or something that's going to affect, you know, your great, 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 great grandchildren. And so that's even longer term thinking and society really has us thinking short term. A lot of the times like quarterly profits and, you know, 2x speed video watching and all this stuff. Um, so I think that's one thing that I probably have an advantage that a lot of other people don't who haven't experienced that. Which, and so 
an interesting parallel that I'm seeing is I train jujitsu. I'm at about three and a half mm -hmm. years with that. But even the people who have trained seven, 10 years, like it takes 10 years to get a black belt. And the people who have trained that long, it's like the same exact thing that you're saying here, where it's, you know, and I've noticed it even just as a three-year blue belt now, it's like you have these these days where you're just like, holy shit, like you're saying, I'm hot shit. Like, I got it. Like, I'm the best. And then <laughs> you go to someone who's doing, been doing it twice as long as you and you're like, ah, oh, fuck, like I suck, man. Like, <laughs> I, I don't know anything. And so it's fascinating what you're saying, because I've even heard black belts, like they get their black belt, they've been doing it for 10 years. And they're like, oh, I just started my journey. Like, I just got to that basic level, like what you're talking about. Yeah. And there's, because we're talking about comparison here, you know, you see someone that's so far ahead of you and you're like, oh my gosh, I could never get there. You know, compare yourself to, let's say you're a blue belt, compare yourself to other blue belts and, and learn from the experience, the, the relevant experience, right. like what they were doing at that point in their progression. And also, you know, don't get, don't get caught in the, the other people, right? Because you can only progress as you can push yourself to progress as fast as you can. And that should be much more of a marker uh, than the external people. And they can be great examples, you know, copying someone's business model or understanding it or copying someone's fighting style and, and sort of learning it. But, um, you know, really like if you physically or mentally, you might be faster or slower. So you really need to understand your own ability. And when, when I was, uh, when I was training, right. When you, you put uh, stress on the body and then your body adapts to recover and you can uh, that's how you get fitter. So, right. You're pushing it as much as you can, but if you push it too far, you get sick or injured or burnt out or whatever it is. Right. So you're running up against physical limitations and, in growing a business or a spiritual practice or whatever it might be, there's some types of constraints, limitations that you're like pushing against in some ways and just being okay with whatever progression you have, as long as you just keep some momentum up. That's really the key is the, um, like, it, like when you're getting fit, like one workout isn't going to make or break your season, but multiple seasons of good workouts is going to make you fast. Right. And there's a couple of things you're touching on here that I find fascinating, right? Is you need to be able to sustainably do that thing over and over. It's not like you can just go work out <clears throat> eight hours one day and now you're like good for the rest of the week. It's like, no, you need to work out one hour each day. And if you can sustain that, which I, I guess that's a lot <laughs> in and of itself, um, there's that concept. And then the other thing that I'm thinking about is something that kind of causes me anxiety is that comparison game that you're talking about where I know I do this with my podcast where I'll see somebody else who has, you know, maybe put out 500 episodes and, you know, they have maybe 10,000 followers and I start getting anxious. It's like, wait, why, like, why haven't I done that? Why, why am I not there? And it's like, well, dude, you only have 30, 30 some, I think this is gonna be episode 35 or 36. And it's like, just relax. Like you should be going back and seeing where they were at when they were at 35 or 36. And, and now that I'm thinking about this, even that's not a fair comparison because maybe they had a different platform that they're funneling stuff in. Maybe they have more money on the side that they're leveraging to help their growth. So it's really interesting to, I guess, kind of bring it back to, well, you shouldn't be comparing yourself to others. It's really about comparing yourself to you. And I do have old episodes that I would prefer people not to go listen to because they're probably really bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't gone back and listened, but yeah. someone wrote to me once. They're like, I went and listened from episode one. I was like, why are you doing that? Like, what? <laughs> How many episodes are you got? How many episodes you got? Uh, 370. Oh, think. wow. Nice, man. Yeah. Well, and even that's the thing is I, sometimes I'll get out of these interviews or listen back to an interview and I'll just be like, that was terrible. Like I, you know what I mean? But but it's interesting because you kind of need that point of comparison with yourself in order to, to progress. Like I'll listen to those sometimes and be like, wow, like I'm saying like a lot or I'm saying, um, a lot, or I'm cutting my interviewee off, you know? So I learn from it, but then mm. it's also this like kind of duality of like, wow, I hope nobody goes and listens to episode, you know, five or something, but it, you know, I learned from well, here's it. Here's the funny thing about that. I have uh, my head of, 
production, Glenn, he, uh, I'll say, you know, check out this interview I did. I, I don't think it was that great. I'm thinking about not even putting it out. And he was like, this is, this is gold. You have to put this out. It's so valuable. And obviously he's got different things that he's wanting to learn in his own progression, his own life. But to have someone say, you know, this, if you, even though you think it's bad, I think it's good and it's, it's worth, somebody's going to find value in it. It's like, okay, great. We'll just, we'll just do it. Even though I know I could have done better in some ways. Yeah. It's just that learning. And, but that's also a beautiful point is that, you know, and this comes down to perception where the way you view something isn't going to be the way that everyone views it. And so your view of bad, it's like someone else is like, dude, this is treasure. Like this is going to send me to my next level or my ev next evolution in business or spirituality or cycling. And so, so thank you. And you're sitting there like, shit, man, I <laughs> don't listen to that one. <laughs> I have a, I have a good friend, uh, Nick Wood and we've lived together several times and he's, he's an amazing coach. He runs the men's group that I'm part of. And he says something that your normal is uh, somebody else's, you know, totally wild, right? Because you're immersed in your own life and your thoughts and sort of what the things that you're naturally really good at it might be totally uh, a, a stretch goal for someone else. And you might even be bored with talking about something that you've mastered, but somebody else is like hanging on your every word talk, talking about that, that thing. So sometimes you, you have to, uh, even the, the simplest things could be brand new concepts for somebody. And so meeting people where they are and, and trying to understand that there's people encountering what you're saying at, at all different levels of, of understanding. A hundred percent. And to even expand on that, it, like at least what it's resonating in me is that there's times where I've had like a couple interviews in a row, or even just like this general concept. I know I've discussed it on the podcast before. And so there's like a piece of me that, or at least there used to be a piece of me that would kind of fight with it. It's like, dude, you've talked about this, like move on, talk about, talk to Derek about other cool mm. shit that he's got on his thing. But it's like, maybe there's a way that we're articulating it now that's going to help somebody in a different way, or it's going to resonate with them in like a little bit different of a way that'll actually unlock them to, let's say the next, the next level as we, as you're kind of pointing out. Yeah. And I think this has applications for the, the progression of humanity. And, uh, as we're sort of deciding what we want our future to be like, some people are ready to build and create new beautiful things. And some people are still cleaning up. They're still healing. They're cleaning up their trauma. They're still stuck in their programs. They're not able to not fight with each other. They're not able to, you know, just the other day, there was someone in my street who was screaming at the post lady. He was so angry that he had blocked her his truck. And, you know, I, I just thought like, wow, this guy, uh, he's, he's trapped and stuck in some way in his, his nervous system. He has all this anger that he's hasn't been able to clear. And I, you know, obviously I felt bad for the postal worker being insulted, but I also felt kind of compassion for this guy that his only response was just like anger and frustration. And I have no idea what his history was, but you know, that's, that's not a natural state for a person to be, uh, the, the way I see it, humans, natural state is joy and peace. And that gets corrupted through all kinds of different inputs. Um, so I just thought, you know, like, wow, like we will continue to see stuff like this happen until all the, all the people are, are healing and, and can sort of move forwards. Yeah. And, you know, the best thing you can do is exactly what you said, I think is compassion. Like, and you never know, like maybe that male lady hasn't fully gotten there herself either. Like maybe she doesn't really even know how to handle that situation or isn't being able to see behind the veil of his anger. So it could be a trauma response within her as well, where, you know, she, how do you articulate this? Like in her past, you know, first of all, maybe she's done that to other people where she's gotten pissed and been on the other side of the fork. 
but it's mm-hmm. also this interesting, how do I describe this? So there was a, there was a situation where I was in an airport in London and the, the, they, you know how, whenever you kind of get your, your bags flagged, they like pull them off the cart and then you have to wait mm. for them to, you know, search them one by one. Well, <laughs> well, yeah, where I was is it was probably like 10 backed up and I'm probably like 11 or 12 in, in the queue. And so I'm kind of just sitting there and I'm like, all right, like there's nothing I can physically do. So I might as well just sink into this moment, be present, you know, Meanwhile, you have people around you that are nervous. You can see all these like little anxious ticks on people because it's like, oh, well, I don't know if I'm going to make my flight, da, 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 da. And I'm just sitting there like, you know, just calming myself, just be present. Like it is what it is kind of deal. And, you know, it finally comes to me. It, you know, meanwhile, it felt like five minutes to me, but I come to find out later, it's probably like 45 minutes. And oh, wow. well, this, I think it's the power of just being present, just being in the moment, just like enjoying the serenity, just taking everything in. Because I'm not sitting there like constantly checking the time. I'm not constantly saying to myself, oh my gosh, if it's like five more minutes, if it's 10 more minutes, if it's, oh no, like I'm getting close to my flight. You know, there's not that panic. And and so to get back to the point of the story, I had a bunch of just different, like like in the United States, you can only, you can have like three ounce containers of liquids. Mm-hmm. Well, in London, they have like a little bag that you have to be able to fit all of your liquids into. So I'm coming back from Egypt and I have like all these like exotic perfumes and stuff. And so like, I, you know, I had to actually, I didn't throw out any of the perfumes, but essentially I'm sitting there with the guy, like working with him, you know, spreading because he's anxious too. Cause he has had to deal with all these people. I'm sitting there kind of in the tone in which I'm talking with you, like, oh man, like, all right, let's figure this out. Like, all right, let's try to fit that one in, you know, kind of playing with it. Cause what else am I going to do? Mm-hmm. Creating this anger isn't going to help. And so he goes through all my bag. I have my podcasting equipment. I have, you know, the, my clothes, my um, the liquids, they're all spread out on this table. And, you know, it's the table that you need to get the next bag onto it. And so I'm sitting there and I like kind of start, he's like, oh, okay, like we got it. Like these checked out, like you're good. And as I start to kind of pack my stuff up, a lady off to my life, my left goes, can you do that somewhere else? Like, you like we, there's other people here that need to get their bags checked. Can you go move that elsewhere? And I, you know, you feel that trauma response within you that that fight or flight. And I kind of looked mm. at her, and before I and I was like trying to process it because I know that if you are gonna, you can't match that energy. If you match that energy, you're gonna make a worse situation. And so then you know the TSA agent or whatever they have in London, he's like, he's like, no, ma'am, like these are expensive things. I'm not going to make him like go through and like hurry mm. up and everything. And I was like, yeah, thanks, man. And so I kind of just like relaxed myself, and um, you know, so there's a key point right there where if I would have just lash back at her, like, oh, you know, screw you, like I've been waiting in line as well, like that's just going to erupt. Like that's just that energy is just going to go all over the place, and. Meanwhile, there's also a lady behind me who I'm just hearing her sigh heavily, like, or like making these, like you, like anxious little ticks, and I'm just, oh yeah, I'm kind of laughing to myself because I, I know what it is, but I'm just not reacting to it. You know, it's like I'm gonna do what I need to do here. I'm not gonna, I'm not going to give my emotional state to your anxiety in a sense. And it was really fascinating too because so I did my best to kind of like put all my stuff away. Um, you know, the TSA agent was like, you know, I'm not going to tell him to hurry. Like he's fine. These are expensive. And I kind of get everything into my bag. Right. And I go to lift it up. And as I lift it up, the same lady is like, oh, I'll help you with that. Like I'll help carry him. I'm just sitting there like, nah, I'm good. Like, <laughs> I don't want your help. I don't want your bad energy going into my perfume. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, so what a, yeah, so this is the, yeah, this is the next little piece, right? Is as I pick it up and go go to move my bag or pull it off the table, the hook of it is actually caught in between the table. And I was like, oh shit. Like had I had I picked it up and forcefully removed it in an anxious, you know, pool, shit mm. would have went everywhere. I would have probably smashed my podcasting equipment, would have probably smashed the perfume. You know, and and luckily since I was in a calm state, I was able to pick it up and slowly move away felt the snag on it. So I was able to hold it. Then the guy beside me helped move the table and like close it. And then I moved off. And so I was like, damn, like had I succumbed to that state, not only would I have propagated this anger, but I would have probably broke all of my shit in the process. 
What a complex <laughs> situation. And for anyone that's, you know, waited in one of these lines, like you painted such a, like such a nuanced picture of, right? Like all those people and they're like, each one has, is like putting their own sort of discomfort into this situation. Those Man, uh, it was probably like really energetically noisy in that space. I was, and uh, yeah, I mean, I was pretty good up until she made that comment. Cause you know, I, you know, I, I've meditated quite a bit. I'm in my own thing. I'm like, all right, like, it's like, how can I have fun with this TSA agent? Cause what, a, like what he, like is and me getting angry, going to hurry him up. It's likely going to cause more mistakes, more trouble, more fumbles and take up more time. And it's such a skill to, when you travel, like learning to be a good waiter, like patiently waiting in some line somewhere is it takes some time to, to get used to uh, being at that sort of pace. Yeah. Especially in these developed countries where, no, you know, just, just like long fucking lines everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so true. And, you know, I think that was something I even noticed in Israel the most was how, you know, it was, it was the most first world country, but it had almost this most barbaric system of waiting in lines in order to get our tickets and order to get to the plane. And just how barbaric, barbaric is the word that keeps coming to mind because of how just of a frenzy everybody was in to just get this ticket to get on the plane. And to me, I'm sitting there like, guys, like the plane isn't leaving without us. Like, we'll all be good. Like it, it doesn't, you don't have to be first, you know? And so it's, it was really fascinating kind of to see that kind of what you just pointed out is like in a first world country, it's almost worse than in a, what we would now today call a third world. I have some of some of my favorite plane conversations have come from being last in line onto the plane and talking with the other person last uh, in line, because you know that, you know, they're on the same page as you. Like, I'm not going to get on there before I need to. And uh, so that you end up, you're like, maybe we should sit together. You know, this is like actually fun. <laughs> That's an interesting That's a good point. way of sorting people. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. Well, maybe let's let's transition this actually into your, you know, you kind of it says here that you were a digital nomad. You had set the world record for like three volcanoes climbed in a day, new species in Yellowstone. Like, can you break that down for us? Um and maybe there's a transition here with like the mental aspect of climbing three volcanoes in a day. So we um the 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 volcano it was uh, this challenge that people have been doing for a while now. I, I don't know exactly when it started, but it's the, th the Three Peaks Challenge was the sort of the colloquial name. And then different groups of people would race each other up and sort of uh, there's an unofficial time. Someone's keeping track of all the times. And I bet Strava does it now. But um, so the, the biggest volcano is Agung, which is 12,000 feet. Where is this? Where and is this? Other it's in Bali. Okay. Yeah. So there's, it's a volcanic island in Indonesia. There's uh, several volcanoes in the center, but then sort of like three distinct with that perfect volcano shape sort of in a row. And uh, it's, it's just like a really nice, um, when you're at the top of the biggest one, you can kind of see all the volcanoes. It's a very beautiful scene. Okay. So we put together sort of a crack team to, to break the record. And we knew that most people doing this didn't approach it like pro athletes would. They just kind of would do it as a, as a challenge. Like, let's see what we can do. But we had all of our feeds planned out. You know, we had our, our sort of effort schedule and our feeds and everything planned out so that we, because I think where people would get caught up is they would be exhausted by the time they started the third one. And their last, the time on the last volcano would be tremendously slow because it's kind of a sneaky hard one. Um, because the first part is uh, sort of dense jungle before you actually, actually a lot of it is dense jungle. Um, they're all, they're all different, which is also really cool. One is big boulders. You spend the first two hours just sort of climbing up, you know, giant boulders. Oh, that's awesome. And then the second one is full of soft ash. So it's like deep sand. It's like you take one step up and you slide half a step back. So it's very uh, exhausting in that sense. And it's done under full sun. Wow. The first one's done in the middle of the night. The second one's done under full sun. And then the last one's in the jungle. And so you get some sunshade, but it's the steepest one. Um, 
And so we, we ended up sort of getting a benefit. We were forced to go really slow on the first one, which if you've ever done a long race, you know that uh, that can make it so much better at the end. And the reason, so we started at midnight and uh, there was nobody there in the, in the parking lot. So it started at this temple, which is like the main temple of the whole island. Uh, and they call it the mother temple. And the trail to climb this volcano is behind the temple. That's where it starts. And we got there and there's nobody there. It's like eerily quiet, but it's the middle of the night. So that's normal. But then we got around behind the temple and there's like 10,000 people there. And Whoa. totally surprised. Our local guides were totally surprised. And all these people were dressed fully in white. And they were carrying uh, goats and chickens up to the top of the volcano to sacrifice into the volcano. This is a secret ceremony oh, geez. that we had stumbled across. And it was the ceremony to begin rainy season. So these 10,000 worshipers go to the top of the volcano and pray and meditate together. And then rainy season starts. And we were forced to do our sort of race, our challenge <laughs> on the same trail as all these, you know, grandmothers and kids and men carrying goats. So we just had to sort of fall in line. And so instead of running up this volcano, we were going grandmother speed for the first two hours. So we were wow. already, we were thinking, oh man, we're behind our schedule. Are we going to even set this record? Maybe we should just enjoy it. Uh, like we could just forget about the record uh, and just, you know, climb these volcanoes and it doesn't even matter. Right. But I mean, what a, what an amazing experience to, to be in a secret ceremony, to see this happening. And by the end of the day, rainy season had started like they did it they turned it they on they it. flipped the switch <laughs> and it and it rained for like four months uh and so you know you could say oh that's just a coincidence or they looked at the weather and then did a ceremony and it's just connected it would have been raining anyway but for me i that was the first time i had seen the power of a sort of a mass intention a mass prayer affect physical reality. Like I fully felt that it was true that they started rainy season. Like I'm, it just seemed. Yeah. I'm on there, but real. I'm on that board with you. Like, I truly believe like that's a thing and that's actually crazy to actually experience it yourself. And I'm kind of shocked that you actually brought that up because that's something that I've been thinking about recently. Cause I think there's been studies and I'd be interested to know if you're aware of this, that there's studies where they do mass prayers in like certain cities for like peace and they see a dramatic drop in the violence in those areas. Yeah, I, I believe uh, originally they studied this with the Maharishi effect Maharishi. with uh, seven seven thousand 7,000 transcendental meditators praying for specific uh, peaceful reductions. But yeah, they've studied it in many cities in prisons um, and it, and it does, you know, correspond exactly and statistically significant with the meditation. And um, this can also have uh, geological, geomagnetic effects. I was talking with Foster Gamble, who made the Thrive documentaries, and he was meditating in the pyramids uh, with these crystals. Actually, I happen to be wearing one um, with these arc crystals, okay. advanced resonance kinetic crystals. And after this, so they spent the night in the pyramids, and they and they had a group of sixty or so of them meditating and using the crystals to sort of power the meditation. And the, the Russian military got in touch with them afterwards and said, you guys triggered our, um, what is, what is it? The earthquake sensors? What are those called? Um, seismic seismic. Yeah. They were like, you guys created a giant seismic event. What the heck were you doing in the pyramids? And they were like, well, we were just meditating. And they were like, yeah, it, it rippled across all of Africa and the middle East, whatever you guys were doing. Uh, we have it on our, on our, uh, records from, from last night. And I was like, Whoa, wow, that's pretty intense. That's wild. Um, it's reminding me of my meditation uh, story whenever I was in the pyramids. Uh, mm. yeah, it, uh, so there's a there's a long version and there's a short version. So the long 
Well, I'll give you kind of the the interesting part. <laughs> Let's start with yeah, the line. Let's, let's give you the <laughs> <laughs> oh shit! Um, there's multiple pieces to it, but I'll, I'll give you the the short interesting piece, and it's where. Um, so my dad is, my dad went with me and he has, mm. uh, he has like a bad knee. He's got some weight that he's trying to work off and he's doing a great job at it. And this whole trip was kind of like his push to see, like kind of push the body, see how far he could go with it all. And he did a great job and he was killing it. And so when this would have happened, we would have probably been about a week and a half into our trip in this whole uh, across Egypt, across Petra, across Cairo. And so we get dropped off at the top of the plateau and our plan was, is he's an architect. So he wanted to do some sketching. His plan was to walk down from the top, down to the Sphinx and do some sketching. Meanwhile, I was going to go into the pyramid and meditate. And so he's, so he goes down and I go into the pyramid and, you know, we have a plan to meet at the Sphinx down in this like open courtyard. So I go into the pyramid and I meditate. I start talking. I'm like, Hey, who am I talking to? Like I started hearing a voice, started like connecting. Mm. Um, it was, uh, the name was Akana, Akana. I don't know why I'm feeling called to share that. If anyone else has ever talked to cool. Akana, let me know. And, uh, and I'm talking with Akana and it's going well. And I get to the point in it where I'm like, okay, like, you know, you know, all my wishes and desires and all this stuff. I was like, what's the next step? Like, what's the next thing I should do? And she goes, go help your father. And I'm thinking to myself, like, my, my dad's all right. Like, you know, I'll, I'll go see him in a bit. So I kind of, I'm like, all right, I'll do that after this. Cause I had set a timer to like 30 minutes. I wanted to be in there for, and mm -hmm. you know, it was probably about 15, 20 minutes that I, that I was meditating for. And I'm like, okay, like what other information do you have for me? And she's like, go help your father. And I'm like, I said, okay, like I will just, <laughs> I want to sit here and enjoy this a little longer. <laughs> Gosh, Akana, just let me chill. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so I ask again, I'm like, what else should I know? And she's basically like, you're not listening to me. Go help your father. And I'm like, all right, fine. So I, I leave the, I leave the pyramid and I kind of like walk down the street towards the base of the Sphinx. And I'm looking there and I don't see any, I see a couple of people sitting, but they don't really have the shape of my father. So like I, I walk up and I see that it's not him. He's nowhere to be found. So I sit down and I text him and I'm like, Hey, like I'm at the Sphinx. Where are you? And he's like, you know, he replies back to me like, Oh, I just got back to the hotel, which is just right behind us. We were staying like right at the base of the Giza plateau. Hmm. And I'm like, you know, thinking to myself, like, okay, he, he, what does he say? He said something like, he just basically said I'm back at the hotel. And I'm remembering what Akana said, go help your father. So I'm like, all right, like, I guess I'll go. And so I walk, I go into it. He's sitting in the lobby and I'm like, hey, like, what's going on? Like, you weren't at the Sphinx. And he's like, yeah, I couldn't really like get in the entrance. So I decided to just come back here. And I'm like, okay, still a little weird, but all right. And I'm like, all right, well, like, do you want to just go up to the room or something like what like what are we doing now and he was like yeah let me just drop off my stuff at the room and then we can kind of go out and so we walk he walks up the stairs we get into the room and by the time we get into the room his face is just super red like not sunburn red just like heat exhaustion it seems like or something super red mm -hmm. and he kind of like almost like passed out on the bed and he's like you know something's wrong and i'm like what like what and he's like he's like i don't know he starts kind of like you could tell he's like uncomfortable and then he goes into the bathroom and starts throwing up like real bad. And he's throwing up, he's wow. throwing up. I get him water. I go up, I get him a banana, take care of him. I'm like, you know, what happened? Like what's going on? He's like, I, I don't know. He's like telling me what was going on. And apparently he drank like a soda on his walk down to the Sphinx. Meanwhile, he hadn't eaten all day. Giza plateau isn't cold. <laughs> it's a hot place to be. And so what I, we deduced is that he had heat exhaustion. And, you know, after that, he kind of took a nap for like 30 minutes. And whenever he fell asleep, I'm like, shit. I was like, this is what Akana was telling me about. <laughs> I was like, fuck, you know? And so then, yeah. And so then he got better, like within another 30 minutes and we went out. Wow. Good, good on you for listening. Uh, you know, cause it sounds like your dad, maybe wasn't even listening to his own body. So right. it's good. You were, you were there. Yeah. So that, and that was the short story. 
<laughs> wow. That's, yeah, that sounds intense. It was wild, man. Uh, I was thinking, I was like, oh, I hope it's not something really bad. No, so. yeah, it was luckily just that, like, you know, it, it wasn't like anything tragic, I guess. So you're right. That's a good point that it wasn't anything worse than that. And yeah, got him water. He's all hydrated. We, <laughs> we would get on with our travels. It reminds me, I was in, we were in Sevilla. We were living in Portugal, but we went to visit Sevilla to see see the place. And we were, my daughter was mm, by six months at the time, so pretty fresh. And it got really hot there. And we were, I really wanted to optimize my exploring. And it just, it just wasn't possible because it was so hot. So we had to do a quick run out in the morning and then sort of a kind of sunset and nighttime exploring. And it was one of the hardest things for me because normally I'm going to spend, if I'm in a new place, I'm going to spend from when I wake up to when I go to bed, just sort of running around and seeing everything. Cause we had maybe three or four days there and to, to say, all right, we're just going to see two things and, and sort of do it in these two little windows and then just chill in the Airbnb in the middle of the heat of the day. Like it, was, it was so hard for me and you know, there's no, there was no way around it. Um, just because we we couldn't overheat a baby, you know. Sure. But, uh, yeah, it it becomes, you, you know, when you when you travel and you're forced to like deal with the situation at hand, even if this is something I have a hard time with. But it, like, I just want to, I just want to push it. I just want to force it and go and, and sort of optimize my adventure. But it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes uh, you got to listen to the universe, with, right? With family. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so this is interesting because you mentioned you have a daughter, but, and this is going to get into like the metaphysics and like maybe the spiritual context. You mentioned you had a daughter, but then in your uh, one note thing you sent me, you said that you used telepathy with your cat and your son. Did you not use it with your daughter? So I have a five-year-old son and my daughter is now three. Okay. And my son and I just seem to have much more ease. Uh, we, we meet in dream time we can co-dream together more easily and we tend to pick each other's telepathy up more easily. That being said, I, my daughter and I have sort of more in common in, in a lot of ways, but uh, my son and I just sort of share a wavelength to some degree. Is that something uh, that you had to train? Cause, cause telepathy fascinates the shit out of me and I think that'd be cool, but is it something like you both have to be in sync about or like, how does that development work? He doesn't, he doesn't drain anything. He's just kind of, he's just there. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make me do anything. Yeah. Um, but we, I discovered this when we, so we do share our dreams. We, we try to remember our dreams. Uh, I'm the most into this, but I'm always asking everyone else, you know, what, did you have any dreams you want to share? And it's really fun to go around the breakfast table and share dreams. And my son, there was a couple occasions early on when he would share his dream and I, it was the exact same dream that I had had. And so I could sort of corroborate what he was saying and then go show him in my dream journal. Look, I wrote down that I was with you in this location and here's what we were doing. And he's like that. And that's what you told me. So pretty, pretty early on, I uh, discovered that. And actually we haven't done that in, in a little while, but then when we were playing, we play these games like what animal am I thinking of? And then everyone guesses, right? Just, just to practice mm -hmm. to see if you get any, any sense or, or what number am I thinking of or a shape or whatever it might be. And when, when he or I are, are thinking of the animal, we tend to get pretty close to, so, so sometimes you might be thinking of a, of a turtle, right? And they're like, is it an alligator? And you're like, well, that's kind of close. You know, they have similar habitats and similar skin types, but it's not the right animal. So I, you can sometimes pick up bits of information right? or, you know, or, Oh, I'm thinking of an ostrich, but you're thinking of a giraffe. Like, okay, it was like two long legged animals and it's not the same, but we, you can tell that there's some telepathy going on, right? but sometimes we get it exactly right. Sometimes he'd be thinking of some exotic weird animal and I'll just be like, it's a pangolin. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> yeah. <Easy. laughs> That's so cool. I know that there's, 
and so I started creating these videos because I saw them online. If you go on my TikTok, like I'll put so, like a random object in my hand and I'll just videotape kind of mm. my hand and it'll be like, all right, use your intuition to figure out what's what I'm holding. But like you're saying, it's about the characteristics, right? It's not about the actual physical object. It's about like, well, did you get the long legs? Did you get the color? Did you get the body? You know, so it's kind of like guess the material, guess the, the color, guess the temperature, guess what it's used for, you know, as opposed to focusing in on those on those speci- what exactly it is it's like get the characteristics kind mm. of around it do you get people commenting and i get two types of comments giving you yeah. guesses? <laughs> the comment one is like holy shit i got this right and i'm like yeah I keep training and the other comment is you're absolutely insane this is ludicrous you should be in a crazy asylum <laughs> so those are the two comments <laughs> I wonder if anybody has gotten it right and it made them angry. Like, damn it. I wonder. Celebrity is not real. I can't believe I have it. I'm so pissed. <laughs> maybe. Maybe that's what they're actually mad about. <laughs> I've been lied to. Yeah, just... <laughs> but I find it fascinating. And it would be cool. So it, it seems like such a, a straightforward way of doing a prelim, preliminary study, right? You could... Uh, in science, like a lot of times you do some preliminary studies before you design your official study. And so you could say, okay, we ran preliminary studies on TikTok 10 times and we got a thousand responses and people seem to be, you know, twice as accurate as we would expect by chance. And so we have this, like, that's how you form your hypothesis. So the hypothesis is that you can use social media to pick up telepathically an object. And then you can validate that hypothesis with a more rigorous study. You know, it's but it's 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 such a fun thing to sort of isolate and tease out. Like, oh wow, we could really do a lot with this uh, sample size. Well, yeah, and I think I think the one thing, the first thing that comes to mind is I think that if it's one of those like believing things where if you don't believe in telepathy or anything, then you just you got to get thrown out because I think like that's kind of the baseline. That's the baseline, right? Is that you have to believe in this in order to have access to it. Because if you don't believe it, then all right, like you're, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like it's kind of, it's kind of the litmus test of, um, of validating it. But do you think that that would have any issues in the actual scientific data where you're saying, oh, well, if someone doesn't believe it, you can't throw them out. Like they still have to try. Well, you could have different populations. You could have sort of a, a random mix population, just sort of a spectrum of belief. And then you could compare it to uh, 100% of these people believe in telepathy. And there's actually, so this is really fascinating because I like things that work even if you don't believe them, because mm-hmm. that's a pretty strong proof. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Bankston method, William Bankston. No. Uh, he He's a an academic uh, who met a a psychic, um, somebody that could do psychokinesis and predict the future and stuff. And he was like, I don't know. I don't believe you. And the guy proved it to him over and over again. He was like, okay, so I believe that you have this skill, but is this something you can teach me? And the guy was like, yeah, yeah, I think I could teach you. So he taught Will Bankston how to heal somebody through just a series of visualizations and then Bankston, you know, acquired the skill of being able to just do hands-on healing, but he never believed that it would work. He was always a super skeptic. He was always like, okay, fine. I will try it. I will be a hundred percent in into this and then do all the steps, but I just don't think it will work because that stuff is not real. And so then he, uh, he acquired the skill of hands-on healing and he thought, Oh, wow okay, can I teach this to other people? And so since then, I think he's done 30 years of research and he particularly does this with whole groups of people that that don't believe it's going to work. And he's validated in so many different ways that you can learn this method and it will heal somebody even if neither person believes it's going to work. And I really like this because there that means there's something about the technique itself that is opening this up. Um, and the technique itself is involves um, like rapid visualizations of positive outcomes. 
just sort of like imagining a movie playing really fast of all the things you want in life. And, and it sort of creates this blurred feeling state of everything you want coming true. And that's sort of what gives access to the actual healing. Um, and you can look it up. This guy figured out you could charge water. You can charge cotton. Like he, he charges water and sends a glass home with somebody and they drink it and they're healed. Jeez. And, you know, he discovered, what was he doing? Oh, he cured cancer in mice uh, accidentally because he was working on this other thing. And then he realized the mice were getting cured of cancer. And he was like, I can't believe this is working. And he's still skeptical. He's still like, every time he tries something, he's like, I don't think it's going to work. And then it does. And he's like, well, I have to write the results of the experiment to be scientifically accurate. Do you think there's, so I know there's a level in like the idea of manifesting where if you hold on to the idea too much, then it impedes it actually occurring because you're, it's like a kind of a counterweight to it. Right. And so on it, like, is there something to his skepticism? Like, like, is there a mixture of his open-mindedness mixed with being skeptical that puts him in this optimal place of not becoming attached to the outcome, but he's like, maybe, you know, so it's like this, it's like this duality of being in that middle of the yin and the yang of, okay, well, I'm not going to become so attached to this, but at the same time, I'm going to be open-minded to it happening. You, yeah, you could very well be right. And that's, it's such a hallmark of just a, of a good scientist, right? To, to not be right. So, so much of science is like, here's what I want to happen. Right. And I'm going to create a study that sort of gives me the result I'm looking for. And it's <clears throat> pharmaceutical companies uh, and a lot of other people and being open to the outcome, just showing you what it is rather than sort of pushing it one way or another. Yeah. I, I think you're probably right on there. Yeah, Cause that's, that's really interesting. And I'm trying to think about it in myself, like, because that's, because at the end of the day, right. It's about, balance it's about balancing right it, no matter what it is um i guess unless you're trying to be a pro athlete <laughs> but <laughs> but for the most part it's about finding the balance between things right Bal finding the balance between your masculine and your feminine energy you know it's so i find it really fascinating that he still applies this level of skepticism versus and this is so fascinating too because i've i've seen it in other people who are kind of like in the spiritual space where they're too, is it yin? I believe yin's the feminine. They're just too yin. Like they're too mm. like, oh, it's all going to just kind of work out. And it's always kind of struck me the wrong way. But it, like, but I believe it. Like I believe like everything's going to work out. And I just find it fascinating where you still need to mix it with the groundedness, the grounded physical reality. And it sounds like he's kind of doing that by applying the skepticism with the open-mindedness of, well, maybe. Like the skepticism is that masculine, whereas the well, anything's possible. I'm going to stay open-minded is more of that yin. Yeah, that's a good point. And, um, you know, this goes back to the lens that I view learning a metaphysical technique. Uh, some people, they, they can get where it's hard for them to come back to earth. It's hard for them to sort of be in the 3D material world because they spend a lot of time projecting their consciousness or, or, or living in a 5d reality. And we're still like, we're still here on earth. We still have bodies. We're still trying to get stuff done. We're still trying to improve our lives and be healthy and have community and all these things. And so can, you know, again, can we apply some metaphysical concepts? Can we apply a technique in order to make our material lives better? Uh, whether it's bring more peace or, or, you know, to, to build a community, right? It takes actually like doing stuff. Um, so you, you spend all this time working on the being and the understanding your, all the levels of your multidimensional nature, but then here you are still like, you still gotta, uh, build whatever it is. Right. That you're building. Hmm. That's super fascinating. Yeah. Because if you just sit in that floatiness space, you're not like, so what it's like, it's like knowing it's like knowing about, I guess, quantum physics and not being able to explain it. It's like that element of, well, you could be the smartest guy in the room, but if you can't explain it to a fifth grader, then what's the use of it kind of thing. <laughs> we have a, 
we had a kid's book called quantum physics for babies oh, yeah. and it's well it's it's very simplified but it's just sort of explaining what a quanta is uh which is the rings of the atom and it's like if this electron goes up to this next level that you know you add energy and you change the potential of the electron in the orbit and that's the quantum that's the like from this level to the next level is the quantum but what's the cool thing about quantum physics is that when you jump levels if you add energy to an electron there's no space between so there's the orbital field of the electron it's like a shell a ring and then there's the next bigger shell and but there's no there's no time when you find the electrons slowly moving between one shell or another it's either here or there and it's it's cool to think about okay in in my life if if you're leading a life linearly because time is perceived linearly then you're going to think like oh i should slowly work through my progression in my career or i should whatever like what we were talking about with athletics right it's like slowly getting better but if you put on your quantum hat well you can simply go from here to there that's also possible and it's you're not you're not always going to do it but it doesn't you can think about shortcuts you can think about well what if i just went straight to the top of my profession like there are people that have become the most popular podcaster in their first season in their first try so that's also available and so uh it doesn't it doesn't have to be that you're slogging away at something or that you're putting your paying your dues or climbing the ladder of success like you could just go straight to the top um if you wanted to as well and so i think this is a beautiful parallel because a you're touching on exactly what i would love to do <laughs> just jump to the top but and and i think you know coming back to you know you being a quantum business coach and this might have something to do with the five levels of abundance as well that you talk about um you know i i'm curious in if you're able to actually apply those things, right? Because a couple things here. Number one, I'm all on the same page as you is that, you know, you could wake up tomorrow and have 10 times the amount of money you have today just from quantum theory, like quantum physics, superposition principle. It all basically states that, you know, you like where you are today is not like tomorrow. You could be a completely different place, right? Instantaneous change. So is there like something that you teach people or like with a, being a quantum business coach and these five levels of abundance, is there a way that you can shift your mind to access that alternate reality, that parallel dimension, that parallel universe it, um, instantaneously or more consciously? There's a lot of, there's a lot of ways we could go here. Um, but one of the key skills is just, working from sort of unlimited possibility and it's hard to identify sometimes it's hard to have the self-awareness of whether you're constraining yourself in some way you might think oh i i am working from possibility uh, part of having a coach part of you know me coaching somebody is sort of seeing where they've put themselves in a box uh and you know how it's much easier to see someone else's box that they've put themselves in um, and, and then you can sort of give them, give them the instructions about, you know, how to step out of the box. But if, if you look around the business world, there's so many people who are doing sort of iterative improvements, like iPhone 10 to 11, or, you know, the next car model year or whatever, but that's, that's not super exciting for me. Um, humans happen to be really good at those sort of tinkering and improving things, but what's really exciting for me is is a brand new thing, a brand new idea, a concept that sort of wasn't there, poof, and now it's there. And that's that's what I think of as the quantum, you know, so the first time the iPhone was there or the first car or the first whatever, right, is is an exciting place to live. And you have to have some some groundwork prepared. There's there's some some ways to to get to that space where you can come up with something new um sometimes it evolve it involves you know sort of becoming well versed in all the research that allows you to have divine inspiration that allows you to 
to make a new invention. There's, you know, what I, the way I think of it is once you get to the cutting edge and, and then you find a flow state at the cutting edge, then, you know, you're just going to be getting all kinds of fat, fantastic new ideas for, for business or, or just ways of being in the world. So the, the, the training, the prep work is to prepare yourself to get to that state. And then it's sort of allowing intuition, creativity, divine grace, whatever, to, to give you that um, insight to, to make the, the new thing that was never there before. And this is reminding me of how they say, you know, it's like, it's something like when you become the master, like relearn how to be the child or like you're, you know, a child, you're ignorant, you merge up into the master, you get five, 10 years of training. And then the idea is to rediscover the child within you kind of thing. And that's what this is sounding mm. like to me. Yeah, there's, it opens up the door, right? If you've learned everything there is to learn in some direction, then you, you get to the edge of the sidewalk, the end of the road, and you're like, well, I, I'll just keep building the road. And then it becomes a playful, yeah, a creative place where you're just like, what do I want the road to look like from here? So then how would you kind of do that? Um, I'm thinking about myself. And so maybe we'll be able to extrapolate a metaphor here if I just focus on myself with this, but right. But if I put out 30 X episodes, right. And I mean, I, I guess, I guess this would break down into different ways because it wouldn't just be the episode, right. It would be, well, how are you marketing? How are you positioning your, you know, your brand and all these different things? Like, how would you I'm trying to figure out a way to kind of articulate this at a master level? Maybe it's because it's hard for me to understand in the first place. But so, so how do you get to a place where a podcast is, is sort of doing something totally new? Is that the question? I guess, I guess not totally new. Isn't exactly the words I'm looking for. Um, because there's a level of it, right? Where if I'm examining my own, it's not completely new. Like I, I kind of see mine as being a very parallel of kind of Joe Rogan, where it's like very long form, it's just open discussion and I've kind of just niched it down to people in this like metaphysical quantum world of reality. And so maybe that's it, right? Is that you would, you would need to find another level to it that would kind of even make it more distinct or make it even more unique. Is that kind of a way to look at it? Yeah. And you could simply, you know, start with something like a mind map which is a which is a type of brainstorming where you had sort of look at all you know okay what is what is Joe Rogan's podcast doing um, that makes it interesting or, or unique and what are some spiritual podcasts doing that are um, you know exciting or interesting for you and you can sort of create this map right so you see there's no hierarchy you see sort of all the ideas about what you understand about what podcasting is and can be laid out right there in front of you. And then from that place, you could do something like automatic writing. You could, you could sort of, uh, you know, write, okay, knowing what I know about podcasting, what, what could be fun and exciting and, and reach people in a new way? Like maybe it's doing a lot more shows in front of a live audience, or maybe, uh, maybe you could do it, um, in VR, or maybe you could do it. Um, you know, there's, there's like the actual way that it's structured or delivered or the topics themselves. Like what if we said every single episode had to look at a mainstream concept flipped on its head, right? What if we had to make sure we looked at the opposite of, of a big idea every time, you know, so, so first you would run really want to understand the lay of the land and sort of like where your understanding was, and then get into creative mode and understand like what, what little experiments could I run from here in order to, to explore. And then of course you would just pick whatever you wanted to do. What was exciting? Kind of, which just like felt right. And it sounds like even going mm -hmm. through that process, you would 
find a way to, you would see something kind of by going through that process. And so it's almost, it, it sounded like it was difficult for you to articulate, but that might be because you have to do the process in order to see that next piece of the puzzle. Yeah. And it's, you know, so in this creative process, uh, it's good to just sort of both understand your understanding, sort of know, know what you know about this. And then, um, and then you can assess it. Then you can judge uh, what you actually like or dislike, or if you're getting some sort of intuition about a direction, right? Then, then you go meditate in the pyramids and you can ask questions with more specificity, perhaps. Mm. Um, but yeah, then, you know, just allowing, right, that, that creative process to, to unfold for you. Okay. And... It's interesting because this is actually going to relate to something that you have on your uh, thing, because I think one of the things that Joe Rogan does really well is, well, he brings on famous people, brings on people that everybody knows about. And so it's like, oh, I want to hear Joe Rogan mm. and this person because I know both of them. So I'd love to see what they co-create. And so you have here that you are really good at building relationships with famous people. So what kind of what does that look like? How did you discover that talent? Yeah, um, this is such a fun topic, and it ties in with the five levels of abundance. Uh, we can we could perhaps circle back to to sure. that sort of framework, but really, what most people do is they just they just have relationships um, that come into their life by circumstance, their family and their neighbors and their coworkers and their sports teammates and you know just whatever. Uh, is who is in their network. And then some people try to do business networking. They go to events and they meet people and they sort of uh, try, you know, they're looking for certain types of opportunities. And that's kind of like dipping your toe into the water of thinking about, okay, maybe maybe there's something to my network. Maybe, you know, they heard somewhere that their net worth is their network is their net worth. And they're like, Oh, that's great. I'm going to go and just do some, do some networking. There is the, the level of which you, you begin to approach it with some intentionality is, is like, okay, what, what do I want to do in my life? What am I trying to achieve? What am I trying to, um, accomplish, you know, whatever, like for entrepreneurs, they're usually trying to find a business partner or find a customer or find somebody that can help them do something, run their ads or whatever it is. So they're looking for specific opportunities and those specific opportunities are always tied to a person that can help them with that thing, right? You want a publisher? Well, an agent, a book agent can introduce you to that publisher and that editor, like these are all real people and they all have specific things they can facilitate. And so when you, when you realize that everything you want in life, like comes through the vehicle of somebody else helping you get that, then you can fill your life with those relationships and you can sort of, you can do it. Uh, in advance. So you can start, you can start by, okay, let's say I want to have a podcast full of famous people. Um, you know, sometimes it takes a couple of years of building relationships to get a really famous person on the show. And, and so you, you would want to be thinking like, okay, well, why don't I just build this relationship for the long term? You know, if I'm going to have them on their show, it's because I like them in some way or they're interesting. Well, why not just be friends with them for decades. You know, if I really want this person in my life for a few hours, maybe I just want them in my life. So I'm often thinking about building long-term friendships with people. And that, that also sort of prevents you from thinking like uh, transactionally, you know, like, okay, I'm going to do this for somebody and then like maybe they'll re reciprocate and then we'll sort of both get it. That's still a little too 3D. That's right. still, um, you know, it can have some needy, needy energy. 
<clears throat> but the first thing to do is really just, yeah, like who, who would be great for me to know uh, what types of people give me access to these opportunities. So I'm going to meet some, uh, meet some publishers, meet some marketers, going to meet the, the mayor of my city. I'm going to meet a bunch of other podcasters because they're well-connected. I'm going to meet some spiritual teachers and from, from, you can sort of, uh, you, once you, once you've decided what types of people and maybe specific people that you want in your life, then you just have to get in the same room with them. So this can be a virtual room. Uh, you know, what communities are they in online? Or it could be the actual room. Like if they're going to be speaking at a conference, go to that conference and make friends with them there. And, uh, so a big part of the strategy is making sure you, you understand what the room is and how to get in it. And then it's much easier to just develop a friendship. And then the next thing is like, well, how do friendships develop? Well, you just like start by being fun and nice and friendly and helpful and you know, whatever. But the first, the overall strategy is like just planning it out a little bit of like, how do you actually get to meet these people? That's interesting. And yeah, because the first thing that you were touching on there is like that transactional bias or bias, not bias, basis, that transactional basis where it's like, oh, if I do something for you, that means you'll do something for me kind of thing. And that was something that actually I think really was my mindset for maybe the first 25, 26 ish years of my life. And I didn't even like realize that it was kind of another way because the way that was appearing in my life would be if a friend of mine would buy like the Uber somewhere. I was always very quick to be like, okay, well tell me how much I owe you for that. Or like, how much do I pay you for that? Or they get me dinner. It's like, okay, well how much is mine? And it's really fascinating because now that I've kind of dove into this world of physics and um, the way the universe gives you back ninefold, I've really come to realize that the way that it actually works is like, you know, say, say Derek and I, you and I go out to get lunch, you buy me food. It's maybe $10 of value, right? Well, if I go on my way, you know, now it's almost like you've, you've built up now $90 worth of value coming back to you from the universe in some way, shape or form. It, it might not be me giving you $90, but maybe it's somebody that you're going to meet, you know, that value exchange, like will come back to you in a different form. Right. And maybe I actually needed you to pay my meal for me at $10. Right. And, and so I, I don't know. First of all, maybe before I go deep, deep down the rabbit hole, is that something that you've noticed in your life as well? Yeah. Um, there's, there's something underneath that, which pervades all of our economic culture, our, our, our whole system, which leads to a lot of problems, which is like trying to hold on to what you've got uh, putting up some sort of, um, that's what, you know, these people don't have enough because these other people have sort of like siloed it away for themselves, right? It's because we view each other as separate and I have to protect my assets from you. Uh, so, so it's this, this whole separation thing and it's, uh, partly a fear of like, I'm not going to have enough, right? I'm not going to have enough to eat or I'm just, you know, going to die or, or whatever it might be. And so, yeah, I, it, you know, I totally had the same experience of like being a taker in a lot of ways or being a matcher, like tit for tat. Like I'm keeping, tr I'm keeping a scorecard in my head of like the things you've done for me. And I'm like, Oh, I better, you know, pay them back. And you know, instead of just trying to optimize for like, how much can I give? How much generosity can I create? How much can I add to the system as a whole? And it, it does take building some trust, right? That that's going to come back to you, that it's, you're not going to die. There's always going to be plenty. And it, it's kind of silly sometimes when you, when I look around and I see how much abundance I have, and I still have a feeling of like, oh shit, I better try to hold on to more. I better, you know, hold it tight. I, I see this playing in my own, in my own mind, but yeah, really, if you, if you come from a place of like, well, even if I die, you know, my, my soul lives on and so that's fine. I'm pretty much immortal. Uh, so like, I don't really have to worry too much about anything. 
if you're coming from that place then you might as well just serve as much as you can. Um, and then of course you're just going to get great things coming back to you. And so then the next piece of this to tie that back into what we were originally talking about when you're talking about like relationships and quite frankly, if I'm being completely honest, like this was a portion of me starting the podcast is this vision of wanting to be able to communicate with anybody on the world at any point in time. Cause I, first of all, I just love having conversations with people. And so, you know, meeting people, talking with people is always fun for me. So then why not have this goal of being able to talk to anyone at any time? And it, if you deconstruct that backwards, right, it's kind of happening right now. And it's kind of how we met even because it's like, I don't even remember really how I got in contact with Beth. I'm not sure if I just shot her an Instagram or DM'd her, like thought, hey, you're going to be cool to bring on. You know, that led to having a great talk with her, which now I'm having a great talk with you. And not to mention, there's other people who I've had on the podcast who then have introduced me to other people. It's like, oh, yeah, I'll bring you on because this person told me to. And the next step of it is I think this was a scientific experiment done where like way back in the day, they were trying to like mail a letter to a certain person. And mm. it was like, you know, the, the key of it is like, you know, if you start at person A and you're trying to get to person B, um, you know, how many people does it have to go through to get to person B? And I think that they saw that it took like seven degrees of separation. So like we're all connected by at least seven people. So the idea was, is like, if I gave Derek, you, if I gave you a letter and I said, Hey, get this, get this letter to the president of, I don't get this to Putin, let's say, right. You're going to know somebody who's maybe lives in Russia or who lives in Europe. And so you'll give it to them. They might know somebody who lives in Russia. So they give it to them. And, you know, within seven people, that letter would essentially get to Putin. And so I, I find this, there's a super strong corollary, corollary, similarity, correlation. There it is. <laughs> New, New word, word. right here. <laughs> corollary. <laughs> there's a strong corollary. <laughs> I'll coin that. Fuck it. <laughs> um, between what we're saying here with the idea of abundance and the uh, by the idea of now connecting with famous people. Yeah, and one, you know, as you were th saying, like, get a letter to Putin. I was like thinking in my head, how quickly could I get a letter to Putin? And one measure of your network would be to ask a question like that. How quickly could I achieve an actual thing? And I think I could probably get a letter to Putin in two steps, right? I know someone who works at the CIA. They could probably, well, let's say three steps, right? They could probably just, you know, figure out a way to get it right, right on his desk. Um, but that person at the CIA would have to be willing to do that. So I would need to be able to send him an email and call them up or whatever it might be. So the relationship has to be good enough where they would actually stop what they were doing and take care of this thing where I'm asking. So that's when we, when we call robust, we, you want to, you want a deep wide and robust network. And the robust part is when people will actually return your calls. If you have something that you actually, you, you build your network, you give and give and give, and you, you have all these great relationships. Well, sometimes you actually have to ask, for help mm. to do a thing. And when you have that request, if people help you with it, when they actually call you back, when they actually uh, email their list about your event that you're putting on, that's a measure of, of how well you've done with the actual cultivating of these relationships when it comes time for you to actually ask for help with the thing. And so, and maybe, right, you have three different people that could get a letter to Putin and uh, maybe a couple of them are really busy. So you need some diversity there as well. So, so that you, you don't have to put all your eggs in one basket. Um, and so it sometimes is helpful to have, uh, yeah, just diverse, you know, across, across age ranges and countries and uh, throughout different industries and whatever, but also some depth, right? It, it's great to know several, uh, doctors instead of just one in case you have a very specific question for a ailing family member. Right. Um, so yeah, depth, um, diversity and robustness, depth, diversity, and robust. That's deep, deep, wide and robust, deep, wide and robust. I like that. I, that sounds a little flowier. <laughs> it's all about the networks. 
And that's interesting too, because that reminds me of how you were saying that you were also a digital nomad or that you were able to live, I think you said in eight different countries you've lived in. And have you noticed that, you know, playing a role in this conversation as well? Yeah. And especially if you're going to a place and you're going to spend a month or three there, one of the things that you want is some friends. And so how do you quickly meet people that you want to spend time with so that you don't get to the end and be like, oh, I wish I had friends the whole time. You want to do that right away in the beginning. And so then you have to be strategic about how do you make a handful of friends right away. And the access point for that is often these super connectors, these people that through the course of their day, whatever it might be, their job puts them in contact with a lot of people. So this could be the owner of the co-working space or the person that puts on the festival in town, or it could be the restaurant owner down the street that just happens to know everyone in the neighborhood. So you can, you can go to these people and make friends with the super connectors first and then say, Hey, um, I want to make some friends. You know, do you got, do you have any ideas? Like where can I find, uh, the cycling club? And then, they're like, okay, here's this, here's the cycling club. Here's when they meet. And then you go to the cycling club and all of a sudden, cause I'm a cyclist, then I have, you know, 20, 20 friends I can go for a bike ride with. And so you can ask these questions of like, you know, who should I meet? Where should I, you know, what ideas do you have? Where should I go? And the super connectors are often going to just, they're going to have access to the most, the, the, a lot of different people. Um, so we did this dropping in, uh, to to the, one of the first places we lived as a family when when I had my kid we were living in Croatia, and we met a few of these super connectors and then we hosted a party for all of our super connectors and had them bring their friends. So we all of a sudden became a super connecting hub where we're like introducing people in Croatia that had never met, and then we position ourselves as like oh this. You know, Derek and Heidi, Heidi's my wife, uh, they're super cool and they have these events and I can meet interesting people there. So all of a sudden we're getting invited all over the place to do these other events. And it's just like within a week, our social life is totally full. That's awesome. And that's just a construct of trying to, what would that be? Trying to establish who super connectors are in these places that you're going to. Yeah. And, you know, you can look around and just sort of guess like who are the super connectors that I already know in my life, uh, right? Podcasters. So Clayton is probably a super connector be just because he's he's actively conversing with lots of different people. So um, when we're talking about the degrees of separation, a super connector is just going to have exponentially more people in their second and third mm -hmm. uh, linkages. Right. So. Uh, you know, it's just a, just sort of mathematically advantageous from, from that regards. Um, but you, you don't, you still want the person who is a super connector to be someone that you would like to spend time with anyway. So, so in Croatia, for example, I made friends with the, the host of the outdoor festival. Cause I was like, Oh, that's so cool. I'm going to, I'm going to be part of this festival. I'm going to do the, the sports, you know, we did caving and mountain bike, racing and whitewater rafting and uh, sailing and all kinds of different stuff. But we were kind of, and, and I was like, let me, let me promote your festival. It was the first time they were having this outdoor festival. And I said, let me do a special interview with you and I'll write it up on my blog and I'll put it all over my social media and I'll help you get your festival off the ground. So I was coming from a place of, this is cool. I want to support it. I'm going to just do whatever I can. And they were appreciative and then when I said, you know, hey, can you help me find a place to live or help help me find uh, whatever, it was natural for them to say, you know, sure. Right. Um, and and they did, you know, like one of the organizers was like, actually, I manage some properties. Uh, there's this amazing house. It was like 300 years old. It had just been remodeled. Uh, normally it rented for like 250 euro a night. And we ended up renting it for three months for like 2000 euros for the whole three months. Right. There's like, 
I don't want to, we could make so much more money renting it night by night. But if we just get you in there, then you can just, you know, tend the garden. And I don't have to worry. Like it right. takes it off my plate. So it was a win for everyone. And we got this amazing house by the Mediterranean, you know, and it just, these things just work themselves out that way. Well, and that, I think that beautifully illustrates where we started with this because of the idea of like value exchange. I mean, you know, at the end of that story there, you got a little bit of the monetary value in there. But even if we take that out of the picture, right, it started off with you giving value in a way to these people that, you know, if we were going to put a price on it, let's say, the value of you boosting and sending out all their information, I don't know, to them, let's say it's $10,000 or something like that. I, I have no idea. But let's arbitrarily say it's about $10,000 for you to promote them on all your stuff. Well, now they come back with a house offer, which I guess actually had a monetary value. So maybe that ruins this a little bit, but <laughs> let, let's say, let's just say arbitrarily speaking, it's worth, you know, or here, here's an element that I missed there. It's worth $10,000 to them, but to you to do that, I mean, it's, it's just a little bit of your time, right? Maybe it's, I, I don't know, maybe it's just a little mm. bit of your time and you could quantify that to maybe be like, a nine nine ninety dollars nine hundred dollars a year time i'm not sure how to really mathematically put it but you know and then when the positions get reversed you're like hey i'm looking for a house in this area if you can help out right and now you get this amazing property at a discount rate because it, it's like coming back to you where you know the value on your time now gets almost replenished because huh, i'm having a hard time articulating this but do, do, do you get where i'm going with this where yeah, and I I couldn't have imagined but when I was right. looking for a house, right. uh, I was like had some you know I was like we went a couple bedrooms in this general area. It was way nicer than I could have visualized myself. the The opportunity that I was looking for wasn't even as good as what we got, and I was limited in in my own you know limited human sure. way. And, and so, yeah, it was it's like you can actually have things work out way better than you imagine. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, at that time that was five or six years ago. Now I didn't have even the sort of awareness that I have now of, of why that works so well, but it just, it just, it just does, happens. you know? <laughs> well, and you alluded to, I guess, uh, you probably read the book give and take, I'm assuming, because you made a comment about givers, takers, and matchers. Hmm. And, I think I'm thinking about how to articulate it now, right? If you said, Hey, I could promote your stuff, but it's going to cost you $500. You know, maybe they pay that 500, but here's the thing is if you go back with that house, like now, maybe they're not going to be so helpful to find that house or they do find that house and actually charge you the full rate, which would have been another $3,000. So, you know, that's where maybe being that matcher, you know, kind of that's, that's the better articulation. I think of that, where you're that matcher, it's like, all right, fine. We're just going to do this at this match level. But in this different giver perspective, this giver and asking, I guess, perspective, you now are able to utilize, uh, you're basically utilizing the universe to the maximal, <laughs> it's maximal p potentiality. Let me give a shout out to Adam, Adam Grant here, the author of Give and Take, because he gave me a huge kickstart when I was starting my podcast. And so I cold emailed him. I said, yo, Adam, I like your book, Give and Take. Uh, you got any ideas for who I should have on my podcast? And told him what it was. And he introduced me to five really high level people, uh, three billionaires, two CEOs. And probably amongst them all, they had, you know, like, 10 million followers on social media and four out of the five responded, came on my show. And uh, it, it was just like, he spent five minutes like doing these quick introductions. It panned out to me meeting these people that I had no business meeting. And, but because it had the weight of his reputation behind the introduction, they took me seriously to some degree, even though I was a noob <laughs> and it, it was, it was such a fantastic um, sh you know, showing me uh, the power of one, the power of an introduction, the power of doing a quick little favor for somebody. Um, and 
you know, how, how great it can be to, to have a reputation where if you just send an email, then somebody that's a billionaire or a CEO is going to take time and actually consider what you're, what you're saying. Right. So, so he's built up enough trust in his network that all these people were responding. And I was like, I, I want to be like that. That's incredible. Yeah. I mean, I think that would be something, it's certainly something I guess I would probably aspire to be as well, where you're able to be in that place of, man, it's kind of hard to put into words that, that, I don't know where my mind's going to it is, you know, we, we talk about, I think in society, there's probably a little bit of struggle for the idea of power and what does it mean to be powerful? And, you know, like to me, that seems like true power in a sense of being able to say, you know, here's a random person. I can actually help them, you know, and I'm just going to leverage my network to help them. And he already knows the value of, of doing that because I guess I'd be curious if he's ever asked you for a, um, <laughs> a favor in return or like if now you're shaking your head. <laughs> no, he, no. Uh, although we've, we've communicated back and forth, you know, every couple of years. So I think he might have an awareness of, of who I am, but I, I think he is just really busy and probably has access to more than enough yeah. channels, right. To get what he wants. He's at this point of just like, I'm just going to keep giving. And whenever I need to ask, it'll just be presented to me. Yeah. And it's, you know, I would assume that he has almost no barriers to, if he has an idea of a thing that he wants to do, he's like, okay, I'm going to do a speaking tour or, uh, I'm going to do a new book or I want a research collaborator. I think he could just snap his fingers and that would materialize. Dude, and that's, and I, I think that's, that's so, that's so amazing. Like it's, it's like, that's energizing me to even think about, right? Like, like that's the power of, that's the power of just being able to help everybody. Right. Like if, if he wants to leverage you for something, he'd easily just shoot you a message. And it sounds like you'd be willing to do it in a heartbeat because of, you know, him, setting yeah. him setting that up for you. And so, you know, it, it kind of brings me back to the idea of, and this is an interesting parallel, especially with, I want to bring Elon Musk into the conversation because, you know, it, All right, let's call him. <laughs> let's call him. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got his number? <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, but right where, where maybe I want to use him as an example because it seems like he works so hard at doing what he does, where he's just kind of this one man show, just doing what he's got to do to get done what he wants to get done versus it, it almost feels like the opposite where, you know, Adam Grant has spent his entire life just giving, 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 but then, you know, being the strategical giver and, you know, asking for things when he wants them. And so it's, how do you, how do you say that? Like it's, he he's built up so much social credibility that he's now able to leverage this entire network and uh, cultivate any idea that he has at a, at a, like you're saying, like you snap your fingers and maybe the poor care. I, I'm getting kind of worked up here and <laughs> I'm kind of losing my train of thought, <laughs> but it's just beautiful. Ah, this is just too exciting. <laughs> I need to call myself that a little, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think it's super cool because then you're able to, create these things on a, on a dime. Like anytime you have a idea or something comes in that could benefit society in a way. And maybe, cause what we got off on here was the idea of five levels of abundance. Is there kind of a way to, you could, you could kind of tie this back into that while I take a second to calm myself down. <laughs> yeah. 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 So this is a great, great example. Um, so the motivation for Elon buying Twitter was that he, he was like, I think we should have a little bit more free speech, right? That was what he said anyway. <clears throat> so he was like, okay, well, I'll just use money. I have access to a bunch of money and then I can just buy it and then we'll just make it free speech. But if Adam Grant was going to do the same thing, uh, he might have a different approach. He might build a coalition of people to sort of... Um, talk to all the board members at Twitter and have them change their minds about how Twitter was run and make it more free. And you would get the same result, but through a different channel. And so if you think about abundance being just doing what you need to do when you need to do it, 
then money just becomes one little sliver of possibility, right? You could throw money at it, but sometimes there are things that you want to do that operate outside of money, right? Let's say you want um, to spend the night in the pyramid, uh, but like bribing is not going to work. You can't pay for this thing, but energetically or favor wise or whatever, it, it could work. I know, you know, a couple of people that have spent the night in the pyramid. So you, if you think of abundance as doing what you want to do when you want to do it, then there are multiple channels, right? Somebody could just do it for you. Like say you want to buy a house, right? Well, you could buy it with money or somebody could just give it to you or you could win it in a contest or you could trade uh, like the guy that did all the paperclip trades, right? He traded a Hollywood movie role for a house. So you could just trade two valued things without money. Um, or it could be a combination of many of these things. So you have to open the, so, so if you're, if you're so stuck on money and this is what I see so much is like, I'm just going to earn a lot of money and then I can do what I want. It It's actually forcing the universe to operate under your fake constraints. Um, and so so if you're focusing on money, you're actually losing like, let's say 80% of your abundance possibilities. You're actually constraining the flow of, of reciprocity of the universe. So, so if you, if you open yourself to the possibility of, of luck or giving, or, you know, just your own creativity, then you can get, do what you need to do uh, much more easily. And this actually kind of, it feels like ties back in with, what we were talking about earlier, um, I'm forgetting what we were talking about earlier, but the idea of placing constraints, oh, with like the podcast of, you know, like this is the way it has to be done kind of thing. It's like, mm. you know, the the universe, the quantum doesn't work in constraints. It's literally an infinite soup of energy. You know, it's it's an energy soup of, soup of infinity where anything can be created. So why you know, there's these mental constraints that we almost play on each put on ourselves. And sometimes they come in the form of limiting beliefs where things have to occur in a certain way. Things have to occur linear. I have to hit X hundred podcasts before I have X thousand income. And it's like, you know, to your point, it's, well, why, you know, it's, why are you placing that constraint on it? It's like, do you want to cut yourself off almost at the knees? Like, the universe is going to do it in infinite ways if you open yourself up to it in that light. Yeah, exactly. And where I go with this is how do we practice opening ourselves up to infinite possibilities? And, you know, as a coach, I'm designing challenges like, okay, I'm going to give you some homework where you go out and you ask for, uh, you just, you just ask for things that that are just so big and ridiculous that you would never expect for somebody to say yes. You know, you really you're pushing your comfort zone with what you're willing to to ask for or what you're willing to. You, you know, okay, you think you want uh, you think you want ten customers for this business? Well, like let's actually let's actually try for a thousand. Uh, you, you know, like what if we just went way way bigger uh, than than you were planning? Or what if I gave you a, an extra million dollar ad budget? What would you do with it? And so there's ways to either do thought experiments or actual real life experiments that allow people to practice working from infinite possibility. So one example that I did was um, I had a friend who taught me her, her concept of unreasonable requests, which is simply just asking for a thing that you think you'll just get shot down for. And then you just try to, you just try to be as unreasonable as you can. So the first time I tried this, <clears throat> I said, okay, there's these, um, these, these big house parties in, in Bali where I was living and, you know, with like a DJ and they had like 500 people and they would rent this massive villa for the day. And it was really awesome parties and they happened every full moon, I think kind of thing. And I said, okay, there's one coming up that's going to be on my birthday and I want the whole party to be a birthday party for me, like in my okay. honor. And I want half of the profits to go to charity. 
And so I approached the organizers of this event and I said, here's what I'm thinking. Uh, it could be perfect. You know, it's like, instead of giving me birthday presents, they're just going to give to charity in, you know, in my name. And they were, they were on board. They've said, yes, yeah, that's, that's awesome. And we ended up, uh, you know, organizing this and we raised, uh, I, I can't even remember, but it was millions of rupiah and thousands of dollars uh, for this charity. And it was just such a blast. It was the biggest birthday party I've ever had. <laughs> hundreds of people. That's sick. And, um, you know, all I had to do was, was ask. That's crazy. That's something I think I need to start working into my practice a little bit more because there's probably these limiting constraints of, you know, especially around, you know, bringing, and I'm just personally like podcast guests. It's like, you know, I'll kind of limit myself on who I go out and even ask to come on the podcast because it's like, you know, if they're over X, you know, you see a number and it instantly is like, ah, oh, if they're, they'd be maybe quote unquote too big and might not come on, you know, or, um, you know, you, you kind of impose these self-limiting beliefs on yourself, even just in those regards and something, and this might go into your quantum coaching. So take this, if I'm interested to hear what you think of this idea. Um, I was talking to a girl on my last podcast and there's a movie that just came out called, uh, every, everything, everywhere, all the, all at once. I'm not sure if you've heard of it yet. Hmm. Highly recommend it. And okay. There's an element of it where they talk about how doing the most random thing can jettison your, you know, your life onto a different path, which completely makes sense to me. But what I'm curious about is like this balance of yin and yang where, you know, you have this structure in your morning or at night or even throughout your day where you're like, okay, I pick up this coffee. I go to this place. I do that. I go here. I do this. Well, okay, fine. Keep that, but inject randomness into that individual thing. So if I always pick up water with my right hand, start picking up with my left hand or alternate, or, you know, if, um, I don't know, you, you do certain things like you meditate in the morning. Well, don't meditate in the same position every day, or, you know, before going to the bathroom, like spin three times, you know, just random shit like that. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious what you think on how that might have an effect on, you know, the quantum physics of your, of your reality, of your life. Yeah. I've never thought about it in that way, but I do try to run lots of experiments. You know, I try to set up a lot of, uh, chances to discover things. So, so just running little short little experiments in my life, um, which often means encountering new situations, new people, new ideas, um, and there's also the opposite of like, once you have, once you're like in a routine and, and you're doing many things unconsciously, then like those things are just running and you you sort of have the full ability to put your attention in into the present, into like whatever it is you're focusing on. So there's a highly productive like if if you go through your whole day and you and, and the first thing you ever have to pay really close attention to is a really valuable creative task, then you can. And coming back to your thought on power, like you'll be approaching it with full power, and because you haven't leaked it away because you've been giving your attention to all kinds of frivolous nonsense, you haven't looked at the news yet, you haven't responded to emails yet, you haven't. Uh, whatever it is, and the very first thing you do in the day, you're as powerful as you can be because you haven't lost any power yet. Mm. Um, can can make it so that you're uber productive, right? You you could spend just two hours working on a thing, but maybe that's fuels your whole week. Um, so both both and um, trying lots of new things, setting up experiments. And also sometimes optimizing for uh, not doing anything new, just so you can so you bring your full power and awareness to to a thing. Interesting. Yeah. And I guess you're saying you see that as first thing in the morning, that's whenever you have those creative juices flowing. Well, throughout the day, we have chances where we can have our attention and our power sucked sure. away from us. 
and you can you can regroup that you can you can pull it back to you but um there's this there's a uh, a book called daily daily rituals daily habits i think which looks at hundreds of people throughout history creatives inventors and things like that and they tend to fall in these two camps people like einstein and um you know, authors, Hemingway and whatnot would do, uh, they would bust out three hours of work in the morning. And then the rest of their day was just sort of free and open for, you know, whatever to see what happens. I, I find three quarters of people, uh, seem to operate best in that mode where they, they do their best work in the, in the morning. Um, their high value, you know, what's going to make the difference in their career and their life. And, and do that when they're at their full power. There's another type of people, which they sort of do this like 12 hour overnight, you know, just sometimes coffee or drug fueled, sometimes just enthusiasm fueled, huge bursts of productivity. And they're just like, they're on a roll and they can't be stopped. Or maybe it's, maybe it's three days of productivity, right? Prince, uh, the artist used to just record for three days straight and not even notice what was happening. Um, so there's these prolific people and then they, they take like a week off where they just don't do, they just lays in bed for a week. So there's different types of these productivity, but they're able to bring their full presence and power and awareness in, in the moment whenever they're producing. Mm. So it's really, I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about being in that present flow state whenever it strikes you. And there's so much of our society culture, social media that pulls us away from that. Right. So it's uh, it becomes more and more rare for anybody to just to sit down and block out everything else just to, just to create. Um, so if you can do that, if you can set your life up and your awareness up to do that, uh, it's, you're going to be economically rewarded for being able to do that because you are doing better work than almost anybody else. Mm. And yeah, because you're doing it without distraction, you're doing it in this flow state, you're connecting to the divine or this higher energy that's then flowing through you. And therefore it's, you're, you're tapping into something that nobody else, well, we all have access to it, but nobody else is taking the time to acknowledge or just even put a finger on. Yeah. And, um, People, uh, I see. I see a lot of people, um, even if even if they're meditators, they they can get caught up in their own thoughts, right? If they they think their experience is defined by the thoughts that they're having, or they associate themselves with their thoughts, uh, those things can rob you of your power, right? It's just like whatever thoughts are coming in. If you if you're not even mastering the flow of thoughts, then you're just like leaking power left and right. Oh, yeah. um, which is why meditation is, you know, so foundational. Yeah. I mean, I think that's huge enough, huge of itself. It's interesting though. I've been exposed to maybe two people recently. One girl's a channeler who actually would have been the episode that I'm going to release before yours. And I think she mentioned mm -hmm. something about how she's never meditated, but still has this active awareness or consciousness to be able to separate those thoughts of, you know, who's me, what's me kind of like pushing the things away. We didn't really dive into it in mm -hmm. the interview, but um, I've definitely heard of other people who have claimed that, you know, you don't have to meditate. And I don't know. I, I mean, I meditate a lot. So I personally kind of, I don't want to say that I need it, but it's something that I've used quite a bit. Uh, do you, do you meditate? Are you able to kind of touch on this? Uh, I'm not really meditating much anymore um, in, in seated meditation, but uh you can have your attention on multiple things at once, once you sort of work up to it. And so I have some part of my attention, which is like monitoring the flow of thoughts and sort of guarding against them taking me out of a state that I want to be in. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Cause, but that's, yeah. Yeah. I, th I think for most people, they, there's sort of like one stream of awareness 
Um, and so it's, I think it's like a skill, a practice where you can sort of have your attention in multiple places at once. Gotcha. And on, so I'm, so I'm, if I'm doing a creative task and focusing on this thing, right, I'm focusing with my attention here, but I might have this second attention on my relationship with the divine, which is a sort of always running in the background. And then a third attention uh, on monitoring the flow of thoughts that are coming in. Like a third attention is meditating while I'm being creative. That's interesting. So how do you, how would you be able to practice that level of awareness? Is that just from the meditating as much as you have, and then you have granted access to it? Um, it's through dream time is the way I do okay. it mostly. Let's um, dive into that. And it, yeah, in dream time, you can, you can practice moving your awareness or your attention uh, to different things with, with greater ease than you can in the waking world. And this is, I I'm still feel like a beginner, even though I've been sort of, I have an active dream practice for six years now. Um, which is where I go to bed with a very specific plan, very specific intention. And then in the dream world, I'm paying attention to different things. I'm paying attention to um, symbols and I'm looking for answers. If I've, if I've made a request for information or insight, right, I'm actively looking for it, but I'm also perceiving sort of the wider context of the dream. And then in the, in the morning, I'm, analyzing i'm writing down the dreams and i'm analyzing the symbology i'm processing the feeling experience but in dream time i think is probably the easiest access point for sort of developing multiple attention and so are you lucid in these dreams sometimes 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 semi semi aware okay so this is actually an interesting question right because when you say semi aware right so i've had dreams where i've become lucid you know, oh shit, I'm lucid, I'm dreaming, da da da, control the dream. I've had others where, you know, it feels like just a programmed response, which I think is what majority of people go through is like, there's zero control. But then I've also found out that I've had dreams where I'll still have like an internal dialogue about the morality of what's happening in the dream. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah. Um, I I find the so the, the the level that I'm at right now is I still have what I call gullibility. I still have this just like accepting of all the wild shit that's happening in the dream as just like totally normal and real, which it is, but I I'm often wishing that I was a little more present and could um you know, even if I'm, even if I'm aware and I, and I am, you know, manifesting something cool in a lucid dream, it's, it's still, mm, I still don't have enough control or I don't have enough. You know, I'm just like, yeah, I wanted to make a fireball, but it came out as like rainbows. I'm like, okay, fine. You know, that's how, uh, that's how it's going. I, I don't know. I feel like I just have this sort of like too, too much going with the flow still. Mm in the dream. So it's almost, do you feel like you almost need to be more grounded in the dream? Would that be a way to say it? I can't, I haven't, I can't really figure out a way around it actually. Um, my, my approach is just more practice, but I, now that you're saying it, I think I probably need to speak with a, a dreaming a dream Oracle, someone who's more experienced than me. Yeah like a lucid dreaming coach could probably give me quick pointers to, to move. Because that's, that's further. something that and I'd be interested to hear what you think about your life. Because in my life, I, you know, just hearing what you're saying, I feel like there has been that level with me recently where it's kind of just like, you know, I have these big scope intentions of what I want to achieve, what I want to do. But then there's like this level of kind of, almost not being forceful, but forceful seems like the wrong word. Like this almost like in directed energy almost would be the way it maybe is the best way to put it where I'm kind of just going with the flow. I'm like, all right, what's my intuition telling me, you know, with this, with that versus being very directional. And 
a podcast would be like, I, like I try to go so super intuitional with the podcast as opposed to saying, okay, here's the 50 questions I have for Derek. I'm going to read them down off the list one by one by one. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Instead, it's just more flow. Yes. So what I'm hearing is, you know, we, okay, can we be strategic? Can we plan? Can we utilize what we know from our thinking 3D mind to sort of optimize things? And at the same time, like, listen to what the universe is asking me right. to do, right? Because if we, if we come from a place of, I'm here to serve, and I have a sense of how I'm supposed to serve, serve humanity, serve the evolution of the universe, serve uh, through just gaining experiences as a soul, whatever it might be, uh, then, then you're just, you know, you just, whatever the universe assigns you, like, okay, I'm just going to do it. And it might be super scary. It might put you out of your comfort zone or it might be kind of mundane. Like sometimes my service is just spending all afternoon just goofing off with my kids. Uh, and that sort of is the best possible thing I could be doing with my time, uh, which is not strategic for business at all, right? Um, so yeah, again, it's it's kind of a both and. Like I'm going to optimize as much as I can in the 3D world for like doing what I want to do. And also just having the faith, like if I, if I sort of, if I know who I am and how I'm supposed to serve, then, then it will work out for me. So how do you figure out, well, I was going to say figure out who you are, but that's a huge question. <laughs> that's, I could take a whole podcast to answer, but, how, but how do you, <laughs> uh, how do you figure out kind of moment to moment, like how you're supposed to kind of serve in that situation, right? Like. Like, do you get a ping that says, oh, you should be playing with your kids as opposed to, oh, go work on your business? That's a good question. Um, it's in my experience, it's not so much that I'm deciding like I'm it's not like I'm sitting down at the beginning of my day and deciding like, how am I going to serve today? I'm not sure if I can articulate. So, so let me just, let me share an example to see, see if that, uh, so sometimes when I am playing with my kids, I get the little thought in my head, maybe you should go home and do some work. Right. I I'm, we're playing in a puddle after the rainstorm and it's just fun. It's just joy. And then some thought comes in. It's like, go accomplish something, go, go do a thing, go send an email or you've got work to do. And in that moment, uh, that's sort of intrusive because it's taking me out of presence. And so allow, you know, just allowing it to unfold, um, so, so maybe we would spend three hours just fucking around, uh, playing in the puddle and the dirt, blowing dandelions. And then I get home and, uh, the conditions are right for me to be productive and I can just go bang out whatever it was. And maybe I, maybe I had to wait, maybe the email that I wanted to respond to only arrived after those three hours anyway. And so, it, you know, it's like, okay. Uh, the, what I was given was this hour in the late afternoon where I can do a little work and it turns out I get a lot done, but it's not like I planned it that way. Um, so I don't, I don't really know how to answer, uh, that very well. <laughs> so, right. I mean, it, it sounds like, well, maybe the, the, the next leading question I would take it to is, you know, how do you identify then, and this might be even more <laughs> difficult to articulate, uh, but how would you, you called it an intrusive thought, right? Because you're playing with your kids. So how would you almost identify the difference between maybe an intrusive thought and a thought that you should act on? Well, personally, I find thoughts that persist day to day and i'm always excited to think them and they fill me up eventually 
it knocks and knocks and knocks. And I'm like, okay, I will do that thing because I can't ignore it because it's just been fed up to me in so many exciting ways that I just want to do it. And a lot of my business endeavors come, come from that or yeah. So you can plan a business launch. You can, you can think strategically about it and like, okay, how am I going to, how am I going to get these customers? How am I going to do the marketing? How am I going to, you know, what's the, what's the post I'm going to write? That's going to uh, illuminate a story. And uh, coming back to, well, why am I excited to do this in the first place? Going back to the very beginning of our conversation, you don't run thousands of miles for a decade if you're not just obsessed with running, right? And so allowing yourself to become obsessed with a thing, an idea that's taken a hold of you because it's just knocked and knocked and knocked, allowing yourself to give in to obsession is such a fantastic fuel for achievement. Mm. It, it's much easier um, to do to do great things when you're when you don't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something that's coming to mind, and I think it's an interesting way that you illustrated as like something that keeps knocking. Because number one, that reminds me of my story in the pyramid, where it's like you know keeps knocking about going mm. to see your dad, and even something in the business aspect that has been is uh, this idea that I'm right now I'm putting together like a meditation challenge. I'm not sure if it'll be. It should be out by mm -hmm. the time this podcast airs i'm not sure but the core concept of it is like i've you know there's the whole idea of like a lead magnet and then it takes you to like the next the offer and everything and i don't really have a lead ma magnet at this moment and so something that has been keeps knocking is a meditation challenge meditation challenge and it's and it's interesting because it's like you know i've, I've had that thought but i haven't acted on it and now it's like you know i've already recorded half of it at this point and so it's it's really interesting you kind of bring it up like that because that's an idea that keeps knocking on me to like to make. It's like, yo, meditation challenge, you know, make this meditation challenge. You know, I sit there and I'm like, what's the next thing I should do? It's like the universe kind of comes back and it's like, well, we've been telling you to make this meditation challenge. <laughs> so at a certain point, it's like, okay, that's not that's no longer considered an intrusive thought. That's just something I need to act on and put into this world or to make into this physical reality that'll in my ways, unlock the next evolution of what needs to be done after that. Yeah. And it's a great opportunity for a couple of things. You know, if I were coaching you, I would say one, set it up as an experiment, like put a hypothesis around this. So um, maybe it's a hypothesis of will this actually lead to more people subscribing or will it sort of grow the audience in some way like will it will it do what it's supposed to um or another way of experimenting would be um i've i've seen other meditations challenges before or i've sort of got a concept of what i think that it would be but um if because it sounds like you're an experienced meditator could I, could I experiment with something new here? Like, could I push the cutting edge in some aspect of this challenge? Um, how can I get into creativity with this challenge so that it's not just me doing a lead magnet because I'm supposed to, but it's me playing. It's me having joy and, and creativity in this process of doing a thing that I'm supposed mm. to do. Yeah. And I mean, my, what feels like my driving force is to just help people like get this information, the type of stuff we're talking about right here, just get people's minds open in a way to, to listen to it. And quite frankly, like my biggest supporter is honestly my mom. And these are conversations that I would never have with her. Like it, because it's just, it's almost outside the realm of, I don't want to say our relationship, but maybe, maybe things that she would never think of before. So then I'm not really able to kind of push the boundaries of my own knowledge. And I feel like that's what happens in these conversations. Now she gets to be a fly on the wall for these conversations and then comes back to me afterwards. Like, Oh, it was interesting what you talked to about this person in this conversation or that in this. Con so, you know, it's, it's really this way. I think, oh, where am I going with this? Oh, it's my way of kind of getting this information out to the most people possible. And I also love what you're saying about making it a form of play because it's, you know, it should be a play. All of this stuff that we're doing should be for fun, right? In a sense. 
I, I feel like if people are taking life too seriously, you're what is it? There's a really good quote that's oh, um man takes serious what, what God's created for fun or something like that. Or for play. <laughs> and I be- yeah. believe it. <laughs> and so it's you know, it's it's really trying to combine all those pieces of the puzzle. It's like, well, I, I really honestly just want to get the information out there. And so what the challenge is, is is it's like, it, I, I'm calling it a 999 challenge. So it'll be nine meditation, nine, nine minute meditations over nine days. And so each mm-hmm. day will be a different meditation um, that I've discovered along my way. It'll be guided. Some of it's guided, some of it's on your own. And what's the point I'm trying to get at here? So like a level of it is like, it is pure value, but then the next layer of it is like, I'm going to be having it so that it directs people towards the final product, which is like going to be the digital course, which helps people even more, but you know, that's going to be, have to be paid for because at some level I need to start. And then this is where I come to is like, at some level I need to make money to support myself because we still live in this three dimensional reality that still uses money as a means of energetic production. Um, yeah. Where was I going with that? Well, I, I already like the, so nine different meditations. Most people probably are going to try one or two and then pick one that seems doable for them. So already this is a nice sampling, uh, I think probably more than people would normally encounter. So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a cool place to start. And then it's, you know, it also gives people that element of like, you know, you can try these on your own. And cause that's what I've noticed in my life is I've always, you know, explored different stuff, but then like adjusted it to me, you know, it's like, Oh, like I like this piece mm-hmm. of this meditation, but I also like that piece. Let me integrate both of them to work with them myself. And so it's kind of like giving people all these different tools or different tools for the, you know, whatever issues or reasons they want to meditate that come up in their own life. And so then they can sit back and be like, you know, I'm always doing the med- meditation number one, but today I'm going to do meditation five, see what happens. Yeah. So uh, let me give you a little bit of business strategy if if you're interested. Um, when people finish your meditation series, uh, talk to them, get on the phone and interview a dozen of them and understand wh- where they are and how you could serve them with your course, right? So, so okay, they're they're the type of people that have played around with these meditations that you've given them. Uh, but where, where are they struggling? Like, what is it that they want to do next? Um, and sort of dig in a little bit to find out uh, where they want to go with this. And that will help inform you of what people would pay for. Mm. Um, and then you can sort of create your course based on like, all right, everybody went through my free download and they got some value of it. Like what's next for them. And then can I, deliver that to them. Gotcha. Yeah. That's actually a really, that's a good idea. I mean, the way that I've kind of structured it is that I, <laughs> I've kind of already made the digital course. And so I'm now actually kind of working mm. my way backward where, you know, maybe, and to your point, maybe what this nine, nine, nine challenge is, is it may not be the perfect, let's say lead magnet to get people to that course. I think it is, but you know, mm. what, <laughs> what I think might not actually hold true. Um, so I think there's a lot of value in what you're saying. And, you know, maybe there's a way to kind of see that where I, I do push that in the direction of the course and then also have that barrier of like, Hey, I want to get your feedback. Like I, because I actually want to know if it did help them, because if I created this, this meditation challenge and people are checking out at meditation two or three and didn't actually do it, then it's like, Mm. wait a second. Like, all right, where did I mess up? What am I getting? What am I getting wrong about people and meditating? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, useful information as well. And since you've already created the course, you can learn, once you have these conversations, you can learn um, how to match what you've already created with what people are saying that they need. So that in the actual marketing material, you can be like, hey, I've got this course uh, and, and this is what it does for you. And a lot of people told me that they, that they're struggling with this. And so like this part of the course is 
helpful for this. So if you're this type of person, if you're having the experience of giving up too soon in your meditation or, or whatever it might be, so that you can link what you've got to a specific thing that people have said over and over again. Mm. And then when somebody's reading that, they're like, oh, that's me. Like, I, I understand. I could see myself benefiting from this course. Right. Yeah. That's, and because then you're using their words, which is also another fascinating thing that kind of brings us back to the whole connecting with people is like the idea of mirroring, you know, and, and first of all, before we get on to mirroring, um, hopefully everybody that's listening is able to, if you're working on a business of your own, you're able to extrapolate the meta, the meta answers that you could kind of uncover there. And I think Derek, you pointed mm. them out great of how anybody could really kind of take that process and apply it to their own business, their own courses as well. Yeah. And this is just such a, even seasoned entrepreneurs always want to understand the experience of people using their stuff, right? It's, it's always helpful and it can, it can be intimidating sometimes because you open yourself up to some people not liking it or having criticisms of it, or just like maybe worse than not liking it is just like not caring about it. Um, but it's once you have that information that you can get from a dialogue, that's, it's helpful. Right. And it helps you. And I mean, as this conversation started, I want to help people, right? I want to serve people. And by having that feedback, you get the direct feedback if, if you're doing that, right? So it can be like you're saying one of two ways, either a super empowering. Cause you're like, fuck yeah, I did it. I'm, I am helping people or B it's like, you got to try something else. Like you're not doing what you think you're doing, you know? Yeah. And this brings us back to the framing things as an experiment. Um, you could, you could keep doing a business direction for longer than like, okay, let's say you're trying to launch a YouTube channel or a podcast or something. And it's like, you're just about to hit the tipping point and you keep going and you're like, yeah, but I really, I really need to do it. And it's just not coming. Uh, it could be that just something is not like you're, you're forcing it. Something is not quite right. And you wouldn't know from just your own experience what that is. So these regular elements of discovery, these little bit of research about how it's landing with people can move, move the direction slightly just to help keep you in line with what you're hoping. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that's a great way to put it, you know, because, and then maybe what's calling to me right now is the idea of, you know, who is the target person that you're kind of going after? Um, because this was something I experienced when I was creating my podcast is I was getting a lot of feedback of, you know, your podcasts need to be shorter. They need to be edited, 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 edited. <laughs> Jeez. Words are eating me up today. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but it did it. Perfect. Poem. <laughs> we planned it the whole time. <laughs> oh, well, but it's, it's fascinating to me because there's, this is, this brings in this element of, you know, I, you know, these long, like something's calling to me, has been calling to me to make a long form podcast that interviews people that gives people raw dialogue between two individuals, because that's what reality is. You know, things aren't perfect. You mess up on saying stuff. You, you know, maybe you have awkward moments. Maybe it's like, you know, something isn't flowing. But like, that's kind of what I felt like we've been missing in society where we don't have these open discussions of expressing ourselves or seeing the big picture. And so I really saw this as being that gap that fixed it. And it, I found it so fascinating because, and here's kind of the shadow side of what we've just been talking about, where, you know, I've read podcast books, I've read books on, you know, how to interview people, and they're all telling me stuff that's going against my intuition. I've even had friends who say, well, you know, I don't listen to your podcast because it's over an hour and a half long. And to me, I'm like, shit, like I want it to be longer because I knew within me that I was like, you know, whenever I listen to like a Joe Rogan podcast and I actually had a buddy validate this, uh, shout out James Phillips. He's actually been on the podcast twice now. 
he even mm-hmm. validated that. He was like, you know, I really love the Joe Rogan episodes that go four hours. The ones that go three and a half hours, the ones are that long. And it was like a light bulb effect with me because I was like, shit, like I love those ones too. Like those are my favorite ones to dive into are the ones that are the longest. Now, the reason I bring this up as the shadow is because not every, it's not going to be aligned with everybody. Not everybody wants a three hour podcast. Not everybody wants a four hour podcast, but you know, I, and I don't know where I'm going with that, but I guess it was just that, that idea that sometimes the outer world might be trying to influence you in different ways that I don't know, I don't know, pushes you against it. But then it kind of doesn't even make sense to me because he's like the pinnacle of podcasting, right? Like he's the number one guy for it. So you know, why would that not, it kind of blows my mind that people are still editing their podcasts because it's like, he just showed you that this model is broken. What, what were, I'm curious, what were some of those things that you said you were reading podcast books and then your intuition was saying the opposite? Like what was one of those things? Um, editing. You need to edit down your interface. Editing. If you're not editing, then, you know, something, blah, blah, blah. You know, mm. I heard that from, uh, there's actually two different things. It was make some noise was one book and make some, no- make some noise, I think was the book. And then there was another like tutorial thing that I was watching and, you know, their main things were like, you want to just ask a question and, you know, have your guest answer as long as possible. It would be ideal. And like, kind of like these, these weird nuanced answers. And to me, like, it wasn't, it wasn't vibing like at a cellular level. It was like c- conflicting, you know, mm-hmm. it was like, it was like oil and water to me. I was like, like, which was weird because I was like, okay, these are credible guys, you know, they're backed up by, let's say NPR or other, you know, um, valid research things. They, this book makes some noise had, you know, four and a half star ratings. So there has to be some truth to it. But to me, I just couldn't get past this notion that everyone had agreed upon that, you know, you look at pretty much majority of podcasts. I don't, I don't I guess I don't know how yours is structured. So hopefully I'm, hopefully I'm not making fun of you here. Watch it, buddy. <laughs> I just realized I was like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's totally cool if it is, but you know, that's the same theme, right? Of everybody has these one hour podcasts. They're cutting the best sections that they see out of it, or they're editing their voice over it. And to me, That was the barrier. And maybe this goes back to the thing we were talking about earlier with, you know, what's the quantum shift in my podcast? I mean, to me, it's like, I I don't, I don't subscribe to that. I don't subscribe to that core belief of, well, you have to edit and it can only be an hour. Cause then I look at Joe Rogan and I'm like, guys, here's the, here's the dude at the top. I think everyone can agree that he's at the top of the podcast. And it's like, he doesn't edit. He doesn't, you know, do these long form things. And so to me, that was my, I don't know. I'm, I'm losing my energy now. <laughs> I was getting pretty energized there. <laughs> well, think about the foods that have been created with the right amount of crunch and salt and fat and sugar that make it really addictive. And then think about pop music, right? You can engineer a seven, seven, seven second hook that is just the same. It's like the junk food of the ears. And it's like what drives right. a best selling pop song. And you can engineer a pop song, uh, a pop popcast, a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you can <laughs> you can engineer a podcast based on all of your research, what you know uh, gets listeners and and um, fits in with how people want. And a lot of people listen to those shows, right? It's it's a it's very formulaic, and, and you can get it right based on the the science. And and yet still Joe Rogan and other people, Lex Friedman, are having these runaway successes because it's it's like the difference between going to an English garden and uh touring the jungle, right? It's like you see the realness of the jungle and you can appreciate the English mm. garden. <clears throat> but sometimes you're gonna wanna just be there in the jungle and just be alive and real. That's a fascinating way to put it. And I mean it explains it explains why some people put, you know, jelly on their, <laughs> I don't know, jelly on their bread or butter on their bread, right? Like there is no structure and well, there is a structure, but there isn't at the same time, right? Like there's some level of like, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with that. There's like a level of, go ahead. <laughs> 
I was just going to say this, uh, this feels maybe like a good place to sort of wrap. And also I have been drinking a lot of water uh, during our interview and I'm feeling uh, it. Yeah. Uh, I should, I should add to the top of my list, go to the bathroom. <laughs> The list of the you know, before interview I just, check. <laughs> I just drink a lot of water in the morning. Hey, and, fair uh, enough. I mean, <laughs> I I appreciate you bringing up that that pin because maybe I'm I'm exhausting myself. I mean, we pretty much got through all your. Oh, we didn't touch on your ability to time travel though. Do we just leave that? Do we just leave that off? Let's leave it. Let's leave it as as a, as, as a, a mystery. mystery, and then uh, if we want to do another I'm one, I I would love to have you back on, man. This was a great conversation. Um, so, all right. Yeah, so, that'd be good. And maybe I'll, maybe I'll get some more, uh, get some more time travel okay, stories. Cool. For, I'm, I'm all for down for it. Yeah. Tell me, tell me what would, what happened in the past. Visit the dinosaurs. Cause I've got a theory about them that there were three dimensional. Well, we'll get, I'm getting off on a tangent now. <laughs> okay. I want to, yeah, let's dinosaur, dinosaur theories. theories. Okay. Um, but at this point in the conversation, I'd love to give my guests the, the floor. Is there anything you would like to encourage people to do i'm going to throw your links down on the bottom so you're welcome to plug any of your stuff um yeah so the floor is yours yeah um well one of the ways that i serve is i run a mastermind for spiritual teachers for healers for coaches uh that are you know doing something brand new that are that are pushing the limits and affecting change in a, in a new way from a new level of consciousness. So um, that's something that I'm in the process of uh, launching right now. And we're enrolling for the, for the next one. So that's called the league of superconductors. You can go to my website, DerekLaudermilk.com. And given what we've talked about in the show, some of your listeners might uh, fit uh, for, for that. So um that could that could be a match. So I, I'll mention might that. even might even be me. <laughs> Who knows? Hey, hey. <laughs> maybe so. Uh, but sweet, Derek. Thank you so much, man. Appreciate it, guys. Go check out his stuff. Um, we'll have to have him back on to yeah, we'll thanks, have him Clayton. back on to be, tell us how to become tra time travelers. Are you doing a master class on that anytime Love soon? It. <laughs> could we could maybe. put that together? We could, maybe we could offer that as a special oh, to your. That audience. would be pretty dope. Um, yeah. well, let's talk yeah. Let's see what we can do. All right. All right. Guys, well, that's, that's Derek Laudermilk for you. Thank you for listening. If you made it to this point and let's keep growing together.